are visiting Maudlin College, which is one of the colleges that is part of the University of Oxford. Maudlin is uniquely situated right upon the River Cherwell and surrounded by walls, so that it is almost isolated from the city. Its location is towards the southeast of Oxford, along the far end of the High Street, the major thoroughfare of the city. It commands a position overlooking the High Street, and its prominent bell tower is one of the most distinctive monuments of the city of Oxford. Today, we will be looking at the cloister and bell tower complex of the college, which were constructed in the late 15th century, soon after the founding of the college. So, we are now walking into Maudlin College with a group of freshers and parents. Maudlin College was founded in 1458 by William Wingfleet, the Bishop of Winchester, a higher-ranking church official. Wainfleet was also Lord Chancellor under King Henry VI, the second highest position for the state. He had a considerable political and religious standing in England at this time. The college is named for St. Mary Magdalene, a sign of its religious associations and purposes, as an institution for the study of theology. In fact, the University of Oxford had a strong religious purpose and background, dating back to its foundation in the early Middle Ages. Initially, the university was a collection of monastic halls for the study of theology. Over the course of the Middle Ages, these halls became colleges for the study of theology, canon law, and philosophy. The university was a major stronghold of religious teaching, and it existed to produce officials of the church and members of the clergy. In fact, many founders of the colleges or halls were influential church officials, hoping to pass on their legacy and religious teachings to future members of the church. Founding a college was a way for these officials to assert their power in the religious world by reaching into the academic world and influencing the doctrines and upbringing of future clergy. It was also a testament to their wealth, power, and prestige within the church, university, and the state, since the founding of a college was ratified by the university, the King of England, and the Pope himself, while England remained Catholic. A near example of this would be the foundation of All Souls College, the other great 15th century college. All Souls was founded by the Archbishop of Canterbury. Both it and Magdalene were modeled after the 14th century college, New College, founded by William of Wickham, the Bishop of Winchester, the predecessor of William Wingfleet, founder of Magdalene. The innovative quadrangle plan of New College and the implementation of a cloister in the college will serve as models for all future Oxford colleges. Certainly, Magdalene borrowed heavily from the plan of New College. Yes, in fact, it is thought that William Wainfleet had some connection to New College, either as an undergraduate or as a fellow of the college. As a member of this college, and as a successor to Wickham as Bishop of Winchester, it makes sense that Wainfleet would have wanted to copy ideals and ground plans from New College for his own memorial to his religious and educational principles. Maudlin actually began as a monastic hall, founded by the Bishop of Winchester in the 1440s for the study of philosophy and theology. The college was founded after the bishop was granted lands by the king, which at first housed a hospital run by monks. Wainfleet's ambition for the college was to change earthly things to heavenly and things transitory to things eternal by transforming the earthly healing of the formal hospital into the eternal and heavenly concerns of the college. The study of moral and natural philosophy, as well as theology, were to assist this aim. Likely, because of the political upheaval at this time over the kingship, which was being contested in the Wars of the Roses, construction of the college did not begin until 1467, when the wall was erected, the first structure to define the college. The principal buildings of the college were built during the late 15th century by the architect William Orchard. Orchard's plan for the college is generally thought to have been influenced by the plans of New College, constructed nearly a century earlier. Now we're inside the college cloisters, facing the Founders' Tower, which was constructed as a principal entrance to the cloisters. The whole complex was constructed from 1474 to 1480, under the direction of the architect William Orchard, and is modeled after the innovative quadrangle of New College, constructed around 1379, so about a century earlier than Maudlin College. The cloisters are a quadrangle, 
enclosed on four sides with two-story buildings on each side, the lower portions of the building being enclosed walkways with open windows looking onto the center of the quadrangle. We can think of the cloisters as being a unique example of the Oxford quadrangle, around which most of the colleges are planned. That's right! The quad is equivalent to a cloister that you can find in a monastery. It's usually a center within a monastery that consists of a yard which is usually quadrilateral and surrounded by covered passageways on all sides. The cloister connects to other important architectural components such as the church, refectory, dormitory, and chapter house. The history of the cloisters is difficult to trace. They were very common in medieval times of Western Europe, but no ancient models necessarily correspond to them. They were basically the central space for reflection and contemplation. The importance of the cloister in religious structures is demonstrated in the 9th century plan of St. Gaul, which is a plan of an imaginary ideal monastery with a cloister at its heart. One significant model for other cloisters around England would be Canterbury Cathedral, the major pilgrimage site in England and the seat of the Archbishop of Canterbury, the highest church official in England. For this cloister of Magdalen College particularly, it's usually a place where students take their matriculation photos, walk around with books, hang out, and have a picnic when it's sunny outside. Yet cloisters were not reserved for monasteries alone. In the 14th century, about a century before the construction of Magdalen, New College implemented an innovative plan. It centralized its college around a quadrangle and also added a cloister connected to the college chapel. Previously, cloisters had not been part of college design in Oxford, but the inclusion of a cloister in New College made complete sense. It would physically embody the monastic heritage of older halls and the study of theology at the college, placing the monastic life into a new environment, that of the college. The insertion of the cloister into the college saw the melding of the monastic and religious affiliations of the colleges with their purposes as academic institutions. New College's plan had a great influence on other colleges, as we've mentioned earlier. In fact, Magdalen was built in reference to New College's plan. However, while New College's cloister is connected to the chapel in arcade covered corridor, like that in Canterbury, Magdalen's cloister is constructed on two levels. What is distinctive about Magdalen's cloisters is that they function as the college's principal quadrangle. Whereas New College's plan made the cloisters and the quadrangle distinct complexes, Magdalen centralized the plan of the college around the cloisters, having them serve the double purpose of central quadrangle and reflective space. Yet the functionality of Magdalen's cloisters in no way impairs its tranquility and traditional function as a space for contemplation. Rather, Maudlin's innovative take on New College's plan brings the idea of a contemplative space of the cloisters into the heart of the college. It signals that Maudlin College as a whole is a contemplative retreat for the scholar and the man of the church. This brings back the monastic tradition of the early history of the university, when the original halls were monasteries. Maudlin's cloisters are perfect for a college that has intricate connections to the church and envisions itself as a bastion of religious teaching of subjects that are heavenly and eternal, philosophy and theology. And the enclosed courtyard structure is not unique to medieval or Renaissance Western Europe either. For instance, it is prevalent in northern China, and especially Beijing, called Si He Yuan, or courtyard dwellings. The name directly points out that the structure of this type of residential space is a courtyard enclosed by four sides in a rectangular or square shape. Similar structure can be found in ancient Roman domestic architecture. The Shai Saucer Asian village in Cornwall exhibits a similar structure too. There are about 8 to 10 houses, each containing an enclosed courtyard. What we can take away from this connection is that it is just amazing how people across the continent throughout history are doing the same thing. The question is, why? Why is that? 
What about the enclosed courtyard structure that interests people? While answering this question is beyond the scope of this short video, it is significant to point out that, for Modern College, the cloister connects the library, the dining hall, and the dormitories. It is an ensemble of educational and residential space. In this way, accessibility to academic knowledge and personal life are equally stressed, making the cloister complex of Modern College a wonderland of studying and living for the students. Just imagine in January when it snows. It takes you how many? Just one minute to go to the library without getting wet. Another unique aspect of Modern's cloisters is the relative plainness of the interiors of the corridors. The walls are white plaster rather than stone, and the only discernible decoration is the tracery of the windows. In contrast to the interior of New College's cloister, the cloister of Modern is rather plain and unpretentious. Even the tracery on the windows of the lower story is not so decorative compared to that of New College cloisters, and the ceiling of Modeland's cloisters is a flat, binged ceiling rather than the vaulted ceiling of New College cloisters. Yet, there is a reference to the decorative fan vaulting in the Canterbury cloisters, just above the entrance to the Modeland cloisters and the chapel. While the fan vaulting in Modeland is nowhere near so intricate nor so to such an extent as that of Canterbury, it does bear a remarkable similarity in the use of decorative devices and coats of arms at the joining of the ribs of the arches. Modeling will want to imitate forms from Canterbury, which makes sense because it was such an important religious building in England and would reaffirm the high status of the college's founder. Nevertheless, the college's decoration is rather plain, which gives it a unique serenity all its own completely fitting to the cloister's purpose as a place for peaceful contemplation. Now let's consider some of the finer details of Maudlin's cloister. The pinnacles, tracery, and the low, four-centered windows with flattened, pointed arches are all typical of the English perpendicular style of Gothic architecture. Yet the crenellations along the roof line strike a note of contrast to the very delicate elements of the Gothic pinnacles and the tracery on the windows. The fanciful and decorative elements of the perpendicular style, displayed in a more restrained style in the maudlin cloisters, are balanced by the grounded and fortress-like crenellations along the roof. If the pinnacles and tracery elements show the aspirations for learning alongside the religious associations of the college, elements that we have seen in the Canterbury cloisters, a thoroughly religious space, then the crenellations show the earthly considerations of the college, its political and social relationship to the students and teachers who live and work there. The crenellations hearken to aristocratic struggles for power and might under a kingship that had been frequently contested during the college's foundation in the Wars of the Roses. They display the endurance of the college through even the most turbulent political upheaval and the miraculous survival of its founder, the Bishop of Winchester, a major political and religious figure who would necessarily have been in the thick of the upheaval. That the bishop was able to survive through the wars over the throne and pass from being in favor with a Lancastrian king to being pardoned by his Yorkist successor is an incredible feat of survival under the most trying political circumstances. The crenellations are a testament to this feat of endurance. We see these crenellations in none of the cloisters Maudlin took for its model. Surely, these were a unique addition to testify to the incredible founding of a college which might easily have become a casualty of the wars for the throne. The crenellations also reinforce ideas of nobility and aristocratic power. A 16th century writer described the cloisters as crowned with battlements, entire in the manner worthy of gentlemen. The crenellations are a decided assertion of seniorial power of the college's territorial claims, and of the ambitions of its aristocratic members. What strikes me about the complex the most is the Gothic carriage. You can see the Gothic pinnacles forming the cap of the Founders Tower, Bell Tower, as well as the two-story buildings around the cloister, 
reinforcing the notion that this space is an enclosed entity, shaping the cloister like a crown, as if the college is saying, "You are given the honor to study here, to immerse yourself in hundreds and thousands of books and resources, and to inspire and get inspired by your peers." The pinnacles are so forcefully sculpted that they almost look like weapons. Through which the college presents the sense of fortification, as if it is saying, "Go explore yourselves. Go expand your potentials with freedom. Don't worry, I will protect you." While the horizontality of the building is emphasized through the encasement of the rectangularly centralized plan, the pinnacles bring verticality, balancing the structure of the architecture, making a snapshot of the architecture more picturesque. The triforium windows are evenly laid inside those Gothic pointed arched frames, and just between each two pointed arches, a pair of small sculptures are dancing on their toes on the buttress, adding a stray of light and a sense of joy to the rigorous academic environment. They are called the gargoyles. A grotesque carved human or animal face or figure projecting from the gutter of a building. They're like little spirits of the students, especially during the college balls, when everyone dances around the cloister. These are all characteristic of the perpendicular style, the architectural style of the English court during the Renaissance. Now let's take a look at the bell tower, which is also a fine example of perpendicular style. The bell tower was added to the south of the cloisters, part of a different set of buildings situated right along the high street and overlooking Magdalen Bridge. The bell tower was constructed from 1492 to 1509, so after the construction of the cloisters. Probably the most noticeable thing about the tower is its height. It is 144 feet tall and consequently towers over the college, the high street, and the rest of its surroundings. In fact, this tower is the tallest medieval tower in Oxford. The tower would have dominated the skyline of the entire city when it was first constructed. Bell towers like this one were constructed in other colleges like Merton and New College, often attached to the church to serve as the church's bell tower. This would have been the purpose of Magdalen's tower as well, but it is slightly different from other medieval college bell towers. For one thing, it is not connected to the church, and for another, it is right upon the street, aggressively asserting its presence to the passersby below. Its impressive height likely was a way for the college to compete with other colleges in the university. Its looming presence over the high street below signals Magdalen College's territorial claims over the area, as well as the college's high ambitions. Even now, it dominates the skyline around it, and this is why it continues to be one of Oxford's most distinctive monuments. Exactly. Not only is the bell tower tall, but it is also a fine example of English Gothic architecture. With its tracery on the windows of the upper stage, the pinnacles, and the openwork parapet at the top of the tower. Yes, it actually references Merton College's tower in the shape and similarity of the openwork parapet and huge windows with tracery in the top stage of the tower. But Magdalen's tower is much taller and more impressive. It is also remarkably similar to other church towers from Western England. And even resembles, though with a more simple decoration, the Tower of Canterbury Cathedral, surely a significant point of reference for the religious associations of the college. It is important to note the distinctive structure of Magdalen's Bell Tower. It has polygonal corner turrets, and the lower horizontal stages of the tower are remarkably plain, punctuated only by small bifurcate windows. It is only on the top stage that the decoration is more lavish, and like what we have seen in other examples of Gothic tower architecture, the plainness of the lower stages emphasizes the intricacy and the verticality of the upper stage, while also asserting the horizontal presence of the tower. The windows of the top stage are huge and have intricate perpendicular style tracery, and the delicate pinnacles connected with equally delicate openwork parapets draw the eye upwards towards the sky, as if the tower is stretching upwards to meet the sky above, a symbol for Magdalen College's religious and academic aspirations. Yes, the verticality of the upper stage is balanced by the horizontal emphasis on the lower stages. 
The tower is punctuated by small windows set precisely in the middle of their side of the tower, only one for each side of the tower at each horizontal division. The horizontal division of the tower is spaced out a good deal so that the tower is given a feeling of impenetrability from its seeming thickness, height, and from the small windows. This was, in fact, a fortified tower, and it was actually used during the English Civil War for the defense of the college. Yes, this bell tower has a very interesting history. It is also part of a famous Oxford tradition that goes centuries back. Every year on May Day, the 1st of May, the bells of this tower are rung and the choir sings from the top of the tower to celebrate the beginning of spring. This monument isn't just important to Magdalen College, but also to the university as well. Not only does it serve as a testament of Magdalen's aspirations and advertise its physical presence and dominance over the landscape, but it also announces the presence of the university to anyone entering the city center from the south by Maudlin Bridge. The tower is a testament to the university's strength and to its long-standing traditions. That is right. The bell tower is an iconic part of the college and also the landscape of the university. The bell tower and cloister complex are only part of the whole college. But they encapsulate very well the religious, academic, and social aspirations of the college at the time of its founding, and the architectural interest of the late fifteenth century in England, the use of perpendicular style, and the continuance of the Gothic. Overall, the sense of the Gothic which we get from the cloister and bell tower complex is one of architectural harmony and unified purpose. Standing in the cloister and looking towards the south walk of the cloisters, which includes the chapel and tower, we can experience the whole complex in one glance. The same refined and spurring use of the perpendicular style, the same use of ashlar stone as a building material, the reflection of the spires of the tower in the pinnacles of the church and cloisters, and the arched windows of the upper stage of the tower, which are reflected in the chapel, unify the complex and draw the eye upwards towards the soaring height of the tower as it peaks above the chapel. This is a serene and perfectly balanced vista. The details of the tower reflected below in the quadrangle, as if the cloisters are a reflection pool, mirroring the tower above. Maudlin is one of the finest and largest examples of 15th century college architecture in Oxford, rivaling All Souls College, the other great college founded and built in the 15th century. Maudlin's more serene and simple beauty contrasts nicely with the more ornate decoration of New College, its primary model, and All Souls, its contemporary. The simpler style of perpendicular architecture employed makes the college serene and peaceful, the perfect contemplative retreat for scholars of philosophy and theology. Modern College was constructed over a long period of time, from 1467 all the way up to the 19th century, when renovations were made to the hall, chapel, and the north cloister. Additionally, in the 18th century, a project for a new quadrangle was set on foot, but only one side of the proposed quad was completed, and this is now called the New Building. Also in the 18th century, the Renaissance gardens that abutted the cloisters were converted into a deer park. Yet the 19th century saw a return to Gothic style in the renovation of the hall and cloisters. To summarize, the cloisters and bell tower of Maudlin are excellent representations of university architecture in late 15th century England. In them, we see the popularity of the English perpendicular style of architecture. This is exemplified in the use of fan vaulting, a style particular to English perpendicular, which we see throughout many examples over the ages. It is first employed in Canterbury Cathedral's cloisters, and we see it again in Maudlin's cloisters, though a much smaller example. It was also to be employed and reach its height later in the 15th century in Oxford's Divinity School, whose architect was the same William Orchard who worked on Maudlin, and in Cambridge's King's College Chapel. It was also to continue in the English imagination in the restoration work and remodeling done to many of the colleges in later centuries, including the Hall Staircase in Christchurch College, Oxford, which was actually constructed in the 19th century. The trend in English architecture during the Renaissance was one of traditional forms and local elements one that clung to the Gothic and continued to employ it even when much of the rest of Western Europe was rediscovering and repurposing classical Greek and Roman architecture. 
The Gothic perpendicular style of the English court and churches was one that meant a great deal as well to the universities. The continued use of Gothic architecture in England throughout the Renaissance was a way of celebrating local history and culture, and for the universities, a means of establishing their indispensable ties to the church and the court. The use of Gothic architecture sought to establish the universities as essential members of English political and social institutions, ones that were rooted in religious and aristocratic associations. The continuance of Gothic and its refinement in the development of the perpendicular style in the 14th and 15th centuries mirrored the adherence to Gothic in other northern European cities of the time but differs quite a bit from the classical innovations and use of local Roman heritage to be found in 15th century Italian architecture. Mm -hmm.